Hello and welcome everyone. Today we have another episode where we take theory from contemporary music practice and combine it with Eurorack patching. Today it's all about space and their interplay with sound and music. Let's get right into it. When we talk about the interplay between sound and space, there's basically two ways of them to interact. There is space and sound, and then there is sound and space. More precisely, we talk about features of space encoded in the sounds we hear and placing sounds in specific spaces and see how they interact. Let's talk about the first part first, space and sound. If you want to imbue a sound with a specific sense of a specific space, the most straightforward way of doing that is to go to that particular space and play our sound in that space and record it with a microphone. The resulting sound will be the sound that we've played convoluted with the characteristics of the space, convoluted with the pickup pattern of the microphone. Older mastering studios actually use this to get a sense of space into their music productions. If we don't have the right type of space at hand, or if we want to record a space that goes beyond the physical boundaries of natural spaces, we can also imbue sounds with uh, certain characteristics that will make it seem like they're in a specific space. In his book, An Introduction to the Creation of Electroacoustic Sound, Samuel Pellman describes the main attributes of a sound that help our brain to pinpoint that sound's location and movement. So if we had a dry sound, we simply need to add the features described here, such as the time difference when the sound arrives at the left and right ear, or the balance between direct and reverberant sound to create a virtual space in which the sound resides. I took the liberty to add which basic sound transformation tools are particularly suited for each sound dimension here as well. Another way to get a sense of space into a dry sound is to convolute it with an impulse response. So you could record the impulse response of a specific place or you buy impulse responses online and then use a convolution reverb or any other type of convolution device to combine them together. And they normally result in quite natural sounding reverb in spaces. In electroacoustic music composition, the exploration of space plays quite a big role. For example, in Luke Ferrari's hyperrealistic music compositions, he often layers different sounds with different types of encoded spaces on top of each other to create interplays of hybrid spaces, as you can hear here. <laughs> But there are many other electroacoustic music compositions that explore space as their main compositional parameter. If you want to describe certain types of spaces from a listener's point of view, Dennis Smalley has proposed a coherent set of terms that describe specific spaces in his paper on spaceform, as you can see here. Again, with many types of music theory, I don't think you need to know all of these terms by heart, but it can help you to think about different spaces in your music composition that you may have neglected before. For example, if you've only worked with the panoramic space before, how about moving your sounds to the distal or transcendent space? Or you mix sounds that occupy the egocentric space with the transcendent space as well to create some unique space interplay in your music. What does all of this mean for us as composers? Well, for one, we could think about putting each sound into a specifically designed space and then see how the combined soundscapes will feel. But on a much more simplistic scale, we can think about sounds being put into the foreground and background. We can think about sounds being put off to the side, or we can think about sounds and their movement in that space that we created. Curtis Rhodes actually gives us a few technical parameters to compose with in his book, Composing Electronic Music, mentioning the exploration of lateral position, vertical position, image width, and image depth. Curtis Rhodes additionally offers some compositional advice based on two sound elements having opposite behavior in space as a means to create compelling music. You'll see a bit more on that in the practical examples. So far we have talked about space and sound, but let's talk about sound in space. What I mean with that is putting sounds into actual real-world spaces will create an interaction between that sound and the space it now envelops. The interaction between sounds and physical spaces have intrigued composers for as long as there is music composition, but only with the advent of music loudspeakers was it possible to put any type of sound into any type of real physical space. One quite famous example of putting sounds into physical spaces is the Philips Pavilion, where we had more than 400 loudspeakers over which the sound was diffused in that space and moved around in real time. Projecting sounds into real spaces using a series of loudspeakers is quite a famous practice in art music. So-called live diffusion has a composer sit in the middle of a concert space and use faders on a mixer to distribute the sounds of his music composition in space. Oftentimes, live diffusion means a composer has a stereo composition 
that he then can diffuse live over a set of 50 or 100 loudspeakers during the concert. Here's a picture of the speaker setup of Mantis, a biennial concert series of the Novos Research Institute at the University of Manchester. Live diffusion is a hugely useful practice for music composers that I can truly recommend you try out if you have the chance, because it shows you that as a music composer, you should not only consider the interplay between time and sound, but also the interplay between time, sound and space. Besides diffusing stereo compositions live, a lot of composers now are experimenting with ambisonics. Ambisonics are basically a way of recording and decoding sound so that they can fit and move in space on any type of speaker arrangement. So ambisonics basically records the movement of a sound, decodes it and then can decode it on any type of speaker array that you can envision using specific software. Before we get into practical examples, I want to mention two more ways of physical space and sound interacting. The first one comes from the field of acoustic ecology. Acoustic ecology is a subset of art music that uses field recordings to create awareness of our everyday environment and everyday sounds. One crucial aspect of acoustic ecology are so-called sound walks. On a sound walk, you walk along a curated path following a specific composer, and at specific points in time, the composer will ask you to listen to your environment. And that way you're listening to specific spaces on a curated path and may become aware of certain sounds that you may normally ignore in your daily life routine. Soundwalks can also be a great way to find new sounds in your environment that you can record and then later use in your sound compositions. Often music composers of acoustic ecology would use sound recordings that they recorded on their soundwalks to then make music compositions. There is actually a spiritual successor to soundwalks in acoustic ecology and it's called locative audio. In short, locative audio is basically sound-based geocaching because what locative audio makes possible is that people record specific sounds at specific places, upload them online, and then for people to hear it when they are at the same place. Basically, you go to a specific place where a sound was recorded and then using an app, you can play back that sound that somebody else has created to listen to at that same position. This sound file could be anything from an actual recording of that location 50 years ago to interesting stories that happened there or to small musical etudes. Locative audio is a great archival tool because you can record the sound environment of a specific place over multiple years and see how they change. But it's also great if you want to make a music composition that stretches out over physical space, that people have to move around physically and using the app to experience your music composition in its entirety. So what does all of this mean for us as composers? Well, for one, I hope that you start exploring space more as a compositional parameter, for example, by encoding different feelings of spaces into your sounds or by looking at how your sounds behave in a specific space. For example, are they in the foreground, in the background? Are they moving side by side? Are they static? Are they diffusing? On the other hand, we talked about sounds in physical spaces, and I hope you have a look at live diffusion and acoustic ecology in your own time, if you think that's useful. With all that being said, let's actually have a look at some real UREC examples of how space and music can interact. For this patch example, I took the descriptors that Telman described and tried to implement it into a UREC patch. When I move the joystick left and right, I will pan the sound left or right. When I move the joystick up or down, I'll engage a high pass or low pass filter to filter out some frequencies of the sound. By rotating the joystick, I will decrease the overall volume of the sound, so I can make the sound feel more distant or very close by. Building up from the previous patch, I now have a mimeophone in the patch as well. The mimeophone will record whatever I do and will play it back after 5 to 10 seconds. So what I can do is when I hear the playback is to respond to that. Then I have two sounds that move in space. The recording that is played back and my response to that. Leading to a lot of spatial interplay in the sounds.
If you have a reverb effects machine in your Eurorack system, you can also simply randomize all of its setting on each trigger hit. So whenever you play a new sound, it will have a different type of space attached to it. Alright, this is all I have for you today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.